Adolescent idiopathic scoliosis is the next topic, and it's a, it's a broad topic. We're going to brush uh, a little bit more over it and uh, see what we can glean from that knowledge. Let, let's put some ideals out and some truths and falsehoods aside. You know, manipulation, hey, you know, I can fix this with a good couple of uh, manipulations. Probably not. Uh, it really takes a team approach. You know, you need your orthotist, you need your orthopedist, you need your physical therapist, you need your aquatic person, you need the parents to be invested in this. So you really have to say to yourself, I am one component of this, and we lean a lot on everybody else too. Because this is not an easy disease to treat. We still don't know what causes it, right? And we have so many people researching it. So when we talk about adolescent idiopathic scoliosis, that classic scoliosis in adolescent girls and some boys, it's different from congenital scoliosis. So the congenital scolies, they have a structural problem. One of the bones don't form right. They form like a wedge. Or they may have an extra piece that throws them over, kicks them over. And you can see how even when you have a diagnosed congenital scoliosis where you have a hemivertebra, um, whoop, there it is. When you have a hemivertebra, it can get some late degenerative cascade problems. And I give people the analogy that if you have a tire that's out of alignment, it's going to wear faster. And your spine's going to do the same thing. It's very simple. So now let's talk about what we're here to talk about, and that's the idiopathic scolies that we see. And probably you've picked it up even if you're walking in a store or a coffee store. I can say, oh, wow, you know. You notice certain things, and you know about two to four percent of people will be affected with this. Maybe even more as uh, time goes on. And the ratio is interesting. Smaller curves we always think of as being girls mostly, but the smaller curves is pretty equivalent, meaning the ones that are less than 15 degrees. But as the curves get bigger, 25 degrees, 30 degrees, it almost always predominantly goes to adolescent females. So there's some link there that they haven't figured out, but I think someone will one day. And uh, you know, if you, you look at the Nobel Prizes that have been awarded, amazing this year, right? They're learning how oxygen affects cells specifically. And so I think one day it'll come, but so far, not so much. So we have to think about what makes these worse? You know, if they're a bigger curve, more likely to progress. If they have more growth potential, meaning they're younger and they already have a big curve, it's going to keep getting worse. And if they're female, it's usually going to get worse. So those are things that we always put in the back of our mind is who's going to have problems with these. And then you have to say to yourself, what are the red flags? Much like cervical spine injuries, you know, when you're trying to differentiate between a burner and a stinger versus a cord problem, we have to say to yourself, well, what's the difference? So the red flags are, usually remember, these are right thoracic curves, as we'll find out. Well, if we flip that, and if they're a left thoracic curve, we say, well, that's not normal or if they have so much back pain that's out of character, characteristic for a young kid. Kids don't complain of back pain with scoliosis. That's not the norm. So I want you to put that in your head. I know that takes a minute to settle in, but you say to yourself, but it's curved and it's weird and it's malaligned, it has to hurt. Kids don't complain of back pain when they have scoliosis. That's not the norm. And of course the neurologic exam, that's the most important thing. If there's an abnormal exam like a a Babinski that's upgoing or a hyperreflexia. Yes? Yeah, the left curves are more common in boys. Yes, they are. They absolutely are. Isn't that interesting? Gosh, there's so many mysteries thrown in here. That's a teaser. Thanks for throwing that in there. Um, so, and then the, the other thing, then people say, gosh, you know, but what about when it affects their lungs? And those are pretty big curves. For by and large, those are not curves that we're going to be seeing. Because when you see something in the 90, 100 degree range, there's usually some other sort of global issue going on, whether it's a metabolic issue or cerebral palsy. So there's other things usually going on. So for the most part, these neurologically walking, talking, healthy high school, junior high girls that have this scoliosis, it's a different thing. Remember we talked about things that make it progress. I, I, you know, the words are great, but sometimes charts and pictures help me. You know, just like I try to show patients their x-rays and the MRI. If you look at this graph, right? So as the curve increases and as they are younger in age, 
they're going to have more of a chance of progression. So if they're 10 years old and they have a big curve, it's almost unknown that they're going to progress. All right, so it's a helpful curve. And they did this study in, in Iowa. Dr. Weinstein did it. He published it a long, long time ago. Apparently nobody ever leaves in Iowa because they did a 20-year longitudinal study. Amazing, right? I mean, think about that. They really follow these kids for 20 years and hundreds of these kids. Nobody leaves. So that's, that's, that's the thing I take away from it, too. And, you know, and if you're 15, 16, and you have a little baby curve, really low chance of progression. That's great. Because we can tell patients, and we can sit there in our clinics and say, here's what we're worried about. Here's what I think may happen. And we have data to show that. I love science and data, right? So I think that's really important when we say to ourselves, how can we educate ourselves and our patients? Think of the differential, right? So, you know, if you have a cough, you know, you don't immediately say, all right, it's pulmonary cancer or it's, you know, it's TB. There's other things, right? So there's other things that can go on with these. Marfans, certainly there. The enzymatic disorders. Um, some of these I even had to look up, like Riley Day and Wernick Hoffman. I was like, wow, you know, that's a lot. So these, you know, spinal muscular atrophies, you really have to think about that. But things that we do see is Friedrich's ataxia, in males especially, neurofibromatosis, these little subtleties that still come about. And we have to say, is there a syndromic component to their scoliosis? Remember, the onus is on us to make sure that we're not missing something. So that's really important. So the, this x-ray is a long standing, and there's very, you know, there's many ways you can do this. You can stitch the x-rays together. One of the worst ways to do it is to do a thoracic x-ray and a lumbar x-ray and hope to God that you can put them together on an x-ray board. That's archaic. So we have different ways of doing it. And obviously, remember that triradiate cartilage and the risor sign that Dr. Corman was talking about? I think that was really helpful because that tells you a little bit about the maturity. Now, the other thing, too, is you've you got to look at the patient, right? So you want to see where's their head in space. If we look at them from the side, is it here or is, is their head centered over their pelvis? And we can tell that as we drop a plumb line from the C7 spinal vertebral axis and does it intersect with their sacrum or the back half of the L5-S1 disc space. That's a really helpful guideline for me. I just immediately look at that from the first get-go. I look at the lateral view or the sagittal balance. Then I say to myself, I look at the AP or PA view and I say to myself, what's the coronal balance? Is their head centered over their pelvis again or is it here? Which oftentimes it is, right? And that's a very disfiguring thing and it can create um, more of a potential for rotation and uh, a higher number of their scoliosis. And you can see there, this is a really good example of how C7, remember the SVA, the spinal vertebral axis, is to the right of S1, which is down below. So these are really great start points. You know, you don't have to be a genius to look at them. You just say, all right, gosh, where's their head in space to their pelvis? And I think that's really helpful. And, you know, obviously even surgically, we have to think about those because we can really mess those up if we operate on them. These are really old x-rays that we don't do it uh, in this way anymore. But I think it's helpful to say to ourselves, we have to be cognizant of if we undertake this, we have to make sure we center their head back upon where their pelvis should be and it shouldn't be falling forwards um, like that one is. So normal development to milestones. Why do we ask those things? Remember all these differentials that we had to put in our differential diagnoses, you know, do they have, did they not get up and walk before they were 12, year, 12 months of age? Did it, was it some, were they a toe walker? Is there something else going on? Is there a family history of muscular dystrophy? So we have to think about all those things. So we want to know, you know, when they sat up, when did they talk? Um, what was their mentation? And also check for spasticity. Do they have clonus in their, when you, um, dorsiflex their feet and do they have tight Achilles tendons because that may be significant for maybe a hemiplegic CP that's been very low grade. Cobb methods, so once again remember we talked about you know finding that apex of that curve and going through it and remember what we talked about for the most part these are right thoracic left lumbar and the triradiate cartilage tells us also these growth remaining. So there's many ways to look at this. And the reason why we have to say growth remaining is if they're skeletally mature, and one of the main things that we can ask females is when did you have your periods? And a year after a female has had their period, for the most part, all these other characteristics are going to show that they're mature. And there's ways you can take an x-ray of their hand. And they have normative values for 
saying that their bone age is nine years and nine months or they're 12 years and three months. It's called the Gruelich and Pyle uh, uh, Hand Atlas, which is amazing, but that's a bit more uh, rigorous. But we can just look at the Rizzer sign, right? This little apothesis that sits on top of the iliac crest. It's a little cartilaginous cap that very clearly marches over. And it finally, when it heals over, that's a Rizzer 5, and we know that person's skeletally mature. So once again, if they're skeletally mature, low chance of progression. We're not going to brace them for the most part. So it tells us, and then of course Tanner uh, grading, that's you know, with respect to the secondary sexual development of a, a child. So you can see the, the tri-rated cartilage, whether it's open or closed, that's, uh, that's the, the criteria, open, closed, not necessarily developing. And you can see how skeletally immature this person is. But not only that, they still have a femoral capital epiphysis there. And then the uh, secondary characteristics. So all those things can help us realize where they are in space regarding to their growth. And the reason is, once again, the younger you are and the higher your curve, the more likelihood of it progressing. So that's the main takeaway. Not necessarily percentages, but just knowing that being younger with a higher curve, they're going to progress. So how do we look at them? You know, the physical exam, the forward bend test, is obviously the number one way, and that's the Adams forward bending. You see two different versions of this. This is a very severe rotational curve. You, I also look for the waistline asymmetry, and it's characteristic that they'll be wearing their underwear. It's, it's, it's a little cattywampus, and you can also see that their, their waistlines have asymmetric creases, right? It may be a very deep crease on the left side and a very flat crease on the right side. And then you can also see where their shoulders are. A lot of times, there'll be a right shoulder elevation. So it's very interesting to say to them, uh, you know, have you noticed that you carry your backpack on one side versus the other? And they'll say, yeah, I usually do it on my right side because it falls off my left side. And uh, adolescent girls will say, yeah, my bathing suits fit really funny. So I'm embarrassed to put a bathing suit on. So they'll say all these things. It's pretty interesting when you talk to people. And of course, the uh, neurologic exam, that's that standard Adams forward bend test. Scoliometer is interesting, and it's a nice little tool you can use if you don't have x-rays and you say to yourself, how do I double check myself? You know, I think I see a little rib hump there, but I'm not sure. You can put that on their body and if it's greater than five degrees and you see a little bit of an asymmetry to the truncal rotation, you might want to refer that on. And I think that's a really helpful uh, tool to have in your bag because it, it, it's a simple way to screen people. And you know, obviously when you screen people, it, people get scared, but at the same point, it's a good value and it's a good thing to say, all right, I'm actually looking for this versus me not looking and just hoping this goes away. Um, so the goals of treatment, obviously, and these are, these are difficult because respiratory dysfunction happens at a much higher degree. Spinal pain as they age, and if you were to keep this large deformity, that could be a main issue. And a lot of the time we're trying to treat this very awkward curve that creates all this dissymmetry with respect to the way they stand, the way they walk, and it really is difficult to be, go through life with a off balance because think about it this way, if you have a forward posture, the only way to get yourself back upright is to bend your knees, right? So that's a really difficult situation to be in. You get very it's very fatiguing and very tiring. So that's why we look for it. So then we start thinking about numbers. And, you know, these really low curves, we have to watch them, right, 10 to 19 degrees, because depending on where they are in their skeletal maturity, and once again, you know, don't forget to ask the females, you know, have you had your period? And they say no, then you can go to all your other characteristics, like your rizzer sign, your triradiates. But that's really a good starting point, because that helps you. And the other thing that helps you, too, is you say, how tall is mom? How tall is dad? How tall are your siblings? You know, if dad's 6'3", and mom's 5'10", and the little girl's 5 feet 1, she's got a lot of growing to do. So we know she's at a higher risk, right? So all those things make sense about when we have to start thinking about bracing. 25 degrees is certainly a, a start point. And you have to think about, well, you know, is it 23? Now, of course, you know, you can think about that too. But somewhere in the 20 to 25 degree range, we're going to start saying, a brace is probably going to be a really good idea. Now, go ahead. Do you have a question or no? Just a big stretch. That's right. Um, 
the, the one thing, is the mistake that we make too, is that a lot of the times they go through their adolescence and they're going into college and they come in and they are referred in for scoliosis. And they're 17, they're four years post menarche and they're skeletally mature and they say, well, I think it's time for a brace. And they're probably not, right? And so that goes once again to that whole uh, criteria of are they skeletally mature or not? Notice none of these are RIS or five when we talk about bracing. Surgery-wise, you know, we're going to talk about more 45, 50-degree curves where they really have a huge uh, apex to their rib hump, and they also have that shoulder asymmetry. You know, back in the good old days, you should treat this way. Poor Dr. Clanton got thrown into this. I couldn't think of anybody else to put in there. <laughs> he's just a nice guy, but, you know, he's been there, done that a long ways, and as a chairman of the department, I'm sure he did everything. And, you know, this is what you feel as a fellow. You go through your training, and you say, yes, boss, yes, sir. Just go through it. But, you know, things have changed. The Milwaukee brace. Um, this is very medieval. And, and they're for higher thoracic curves, but they were made for other ones. My sister actually wore this for three years. And it's, uh, it's amazing how limiting it is. Um, I think she set it on fire. I wish that he had kept it, but it would have been amazing to have that. So, um, you know, then we go to this, and maybe things have changed a little bit here. And you can see now the bracing is amazing. And the prosthetics and orthotics folks are just incredible how they can put pressure sensors, they can do pads, they can check the x-rays in and out of the brace to make sure they get an appropriate correction. Because in the end, we don't just want to put a brace on. We want to put a brace on that applies a force that creates a correction moment to that thoracic and lumbar curve. It's almost like a, a, a cast where we're trying to just fit them. Right? So it really is helpful. And the hard part is patients have to be compliant. End of story. If you're not going to wear it, it's not going to work. And they have put sens heat sensors in the braces. Um, and they can measure it and say, well, OK, well, let's check your reading. And it's an app. It's Bluetooth. And they get the app out. And they say, well, the heat sensor was on for 15 hours on Tuesday, 3 on Wednesday, and 10 on Thursday. It's amazing what they can do now, right? It's almost like the football helmets where they have impact sensors in the Rydell helmets now. I just went to a talk on that. It's incredible um, talking about what they can put for sensors that you don't even know they're built into the plastic. So it's a, it's, it's a hard thing to get a teenage, I mean, it's hard for me to get my teenager to even put the laundry away. You know, the laundry ends up underneath the bed. I can't imagine if she had to wear a brace. So I get it. Um, so, you know, youth, treat them with a brace, make sure they're pre-manarchal or up to one year post manarchy and hopefully we can get some good results. This is an interesting idea. So, when do we start, when do we finish? You know, they have to be skeletally immature. That's number one thing that I always say to people. And you tell them 18 hours a day and you hope for 16 and maybe even you get 22. It's hard. You know, because you want them to still be active. They have to take a shower. You want them to go do their PT. You want them to swim, keep their core strong. You want them to be a kid. Um, but it's not easy. And once again, it comes to a team. And brace treatment is not easy. Uh, I tell you, it's one of the hardest things I do because there's some very unhappy kids and very unhappy parents because they've been yelling at each other on the way in. How long have you been wearing your brace? You haven't been wearing your brace? Oh, my God. What's the doctor going to say? And this is the, you walk in and you can feel the tension. You know, and you're just like, oh boy, here we go. All right. So I'll say, I always say to my patients, I'm not a marriage and family therapist. You know, I said, you're in the wrong office, but this is what you do. Please. So, I'm just reading something. She and I are taking this Tai Chi class, and I just wondered, hey, I wonder if someone who's getting chiropractic as they get older does PT or does some, some type of training, can that actually help with their kyphosis? So I looked at some studies, and they were actually really interesting. Like a six-week trial of doing yoga or or tai chi was able to partially reverse the kyphosis. So obviously, if that's an older gener generation, even from skeletal skeletal mature, you think you can still probably have some some correction. I think you, there's no question. The muscles are the dynamic stabilizer, right? So the the static stabilizers. We talk about the bones, the ligaments, the discs. But then you add this beautiful layer of muscles, right? 
And no question, that's why I say I, I believe a lot in keeping the core strong and swimming in posture. So extension and flexion is a different moment. And the rector spinae are made for that, right? You know, I even, you know, even when you said that, when you were talking about extension, what did I do? <laughs> right? Immediately. Almost if you look around the room and people almost all put their shoulders back. That's an easier thing to do. Scoliosis is a rotational movement. So it's very hard to say, all right, I'm going to contract my left transverse abdominis and release my right one. All right, I feel better. You know, it's pretty hard. <laughs> you know, I mean, you have more kinesthetic sense than I do if you can do that. So yes, I, I think the muscles are beautiful. I, I think the dynamic stabilizers are incredible. But we live in three different planes. So yeah, but never underestimate it, right? Yeah, please. What do you think about night racing when you're six to eight hours off per day? You advocate for night versus activity during the day and sports practices. That's what I do. I tell them to wear it at night. Yeah, because you know, why not? You know, you get six hours during the day of freedom. Why not? And eventually, kids can sleep. You ever seen your kids sleep? They sleep on the floor, right? They're not like us where we have to have a pillow and you have to turn the light off, you know? My kids can sleep anywhere, right? So that's why I tell them wear at night. The caveat, though, is checking their skin because they're unprotected. Think about how much, how much we go to at length in the OR to protect someone when they're prone, right? Having their arms perfect, having their hips perfect, make sure their toes aren't resting on anything. Same thing. When a kid sleeps in a brace, you know, they can get a pressure sore if you don't check it for weeks on end. And that's why that team approach comes into play. But I think be a kid. Most of all, be a kid. Um, because you only get one shot at being a kid. So, you know, six hours just didn't work. And the pressure sensors, which I think are really neat and handy, um, show that longer you wear it, more success rate. It's clear. So that, and it's, you know, there's no other way to say it. It's, uh, they've done studies, they've wanted to make it seem that it's easier, but think about your teeth. You know, all these people are doing Invisalign now, right? You gotta wear Invisalign. You know, if you don't wear it, it's not gonna work. So that's what it comes down with bracing. So, and that's, this, goes, this next slide goes back to your point about when do we need to get our prosthetic and our orthotic folks involved? When do we need to make sure that everything's okay? When do we need to get our physical therapists and Tai Chi and our swim therapists involved? All of, all of them, all the time. Because the worst thing you can do is lose your core strength, get a pressure sore, have a malfitting brace, have a rub on their brachial plexus. I've even seen it where they get a brachial plexopathy, right? So they have a little bit of a wrist drop because one of the cords of the brachial plexus, they lose weight in the brace, so it rides up. They get skinnier, it rides in their armpit, and they don't tell anybody. They're embarrassed about their brace, right? So they're not gonna tell you, it's an adolescent girl. She's not gonna tell you that my brace doesn't fit, right? She, the onus is on us as a team. So that's what we gotta do. So when do we choose surgery? And, uh, you know, I tried to highlight things. I realized after I did the highlighter, it looked like a, you ever seen those snow cones that have red, white, and blue on them? So it looks like a snow cone. So my snow cone slide. What's that? Make America great. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, it's a, a MAGA slide. Um, so it's, a, you know, clearly the thing that gets so much press and so much drama is the pulmonary compromise. That's uncommon. Put that at Put that to rest, put that to bed. That's not the number one reason we do these surgeries. You know, you, if you've got a 90, 100, 110 degree curve, that's an abnormal curve. We've missed the boat a little bit on that if we were getting to that point. But when you get into these other volumes, you know, the, the 60 to 100 degrees, you know, you do get some, you do a, a forced vital capacity, FEV1, the pulmonary function test, the PFTs, you'll see some degradation. It's amazing what the kids are actually trying to overcome because they have a little bit of thoracic rotation. Maybe they have a little bit of atrophy to one of their bronchioli. So it's incredible what happens. So you have to follow them because maybe truly there can be some respiratory um, compromise that's under, that they're undergoing. And don't forget, as they get older, degenerative scoliosis, not just de novo scoliosis, a lot of people as they age, remember, the spine, if you look at it, and I always use the model, you know, to, you know this is, I took this play from the Dr. Corwin's playbook. 
so I hope you don't mind if I use it, but you grab the transverse processes and you squeeze them together, right, and the disc collapses and it just kind of comes down. But if you have asymmetric collapse, right, it comes to this curvature and that same analogy of when the tires wear, we wear, and you get the idiopathic disc resorption, you get foraminal collapse. Not only can you get a nerve root compromise on this concavity where it collapses on the root, you can get a traction injury on the convexity. That's not abnormal. You can have that. Nerves don't like to be pulled, pushed, you know, abraded. Think about your eye. Your eye's a nerve ending, right? You ever had something pokey in the eye? You're riding your bike and something sticks in the eye, you're like, really? You know, you got to pull over, your eye's tearing, you feel terrible. So the nerves are the same way. So you really have to be cognizant of what's going to happen later in life. And why do we do this? So you can also tell them, say, all right, this is a flexible curve. We think about secondary curves. So not all these curves. So if we look at this nice, long standing, you can see how there's a, a thoracolumbar lumbar component to the curve and also even a higher right thoracic curve. All right? And you can see that when they bend one way or another, the thoracic curve goes down. But more importantly, look what happens to that lumbar component. It really decreases. So it tells you, hey, I can do a selective fusion on that because there are compensatory curves. A lot of the times the thoracic curves are the main instigator of the problem. Not always. But you have to think about that and say to yourself, all right, can I do a surgery with less insult to that patient based on how flexible their curve is? And that's a, that's a whole nother story. You know, certainly there's a times when we can't and you can see how you can do these amazing corrections and these always get oohs and ahs and you know patients love putting these pictures up on their refrigerator so it's fun to show them and you know but the the why's and how we do it is not um, the important part of this talk it's more of when do we have to brace and when do we have to go to the next step and that's knowing from your end all right what needs to be done to refer so I think the important thing is also saying to yourself it's a team, right? Don't ever feel like an island. Uh, because, you know, I feel like this sometimes. You sit there and you think to yourself, should I, shouldn't I? I don't know. Maybe we should follow it. You know, are they mature? They're almost there. Uh, it's a big investment in the time of the patient and their family. Because remember, when you treat kids, you're treating three, a child and two parents for the most part. So it's a lot. And you really have to be very vigilant of that. So let's go through some cases, but I think that's what you see. And I appreciate, you know, this is Dr. Corman. These are his cases, so it's very helpful to go through them. And you can see how there's just a very lateral tilt. And we say to ourselves, gosh, you know, obviously we're going to probably get the long standings. Is there a scoliosis here? And the one thing that you may astutely pick up and say, you know what? That pelvic brim is asymmetric, isn't it? All right? So a lot of the times we can put our lines on the femoral heads and say to ourselves, wait a minute, that's a leg length discrepancy. And we can even send them to our foot and ankle colleagues where they can put blocks underneath them, level their pelvis, and all of a sudden it's a little different. So you can put a little insert or shim into their shoe, and depending on high bit, how high the shim is, it can go internal, external to the shim. So that's a more of a compensatory scoliosis. Remember, it's like a sunflower, right? We want to keep our pelvis and our head aligned. Because if we fall forward, that's not great. If we fall to the side, that's not great. So our body has this natural way of getting us where we want to be. Right? Much like when we lose lordosis in the spine. Right? So if we lose lordosis in the spine, what do we do compensatory? We lose thoracic kyphosis. So it's the same kind of a compensatory moment. So then you also look at other things and say, all right, is this a scoliosis? And that's a very sharp angle, isn't it? So you're saying, that looks weird. And certainly, that once again, that hemivertebra, so that's a congenital hemivertebra, and we have to think to ourselves, well, that's abnormal, because that really isn't uh, what a classic well-formed thoracolumbar lumbar right thoracic left lumbar curve is. So if you, if you remember one thing, always think, gosh, I think it's supposed to be right thoracic left lumbar. That's kind of the normal thing, and the right shoulder is usually a little higher, and that left abdominal crease is a little deeper. So that's a hemivertebra. And that's a whole different treatment guideline, right? And that might, might, might be something where we do a vertebrectomy. We might want to do some type of facetectomy. So that's a whole different issue. This one's a really neat one, and I, I like it for a lot of reasons because it goes back to really looking at x-rays. And the, one of the last cases Dr. Corman showed us, he said, what else did we miss here? 
And he showed that very subtle 15 degree curvature in that 14 year old girl. I love that because that's where I, I start. I, I almost always look at the Spanish processes and say to myself, where are the Spanish processes in relation to the middle of the two pedicles? So if you look at this one, remember, so before the dots go on there, you can see how there's pedicles, Spanish process, pedicles, Spanish process, pedicles, Spanish process. So it's an owl eye with a nose in the middle. And that tells me, is there a rotation? No. So by definition, if there's no vertebral rotation, it's not a scoliosis, right? Remember the three-dimensional issue that we just talked about? Not only do they bend in the frontal plane, but they rotate. And that's why you get that weird rib asymmetry too. So this is a secondary curve, and that's a disc herniation. That's something that's being very protective, and they're launching themselves away from that foramen where the disc is stuck into that root. So it's a compensatory curve. This is, this is something that we see quite a bit where people come in, and they come in like this because they're trying to get that foramen auto-decompressed, right? They're trying to take the pressure off of it. And it we're smart as humans. We know what to do. Um, and then we look at this, and you know, by definition, it's a baby curve. I didn't put the numbers on it, but let's say it's less than 10 degrees, and it is. So less than 10 degrees, we don't want to call it a scoliosis. Right? You don't want to define it as such. You want to call it maybe a idiopathic curvature or some other diagnosis. And then we look at something like this. And, and you know, obviously, you guys knew at some point I was going to give you a yes. So if you're a test taker, right, which most of you are at this point, you're pretty good test takers, that's how you've gotten here. You say to yourself, look at how asymmetrically, you know, curved, look at those spinous processes, they come all the way out to the side. Uh, she's shorter, right, which is, makes sense. If you have a string and you collapse it, right, versus if you pull it apart, she's shorter than her mom, she hasn't had her period, she's risen one. You can just pick it up here, the pelvis here, and there's no apophyseal cartilage. So you say, and hopefully we'll have a pelvis too, where we'll say, okay, the triradic cartilage is open also. And it's 35 degrees, so big curve, and it's to the right. Um, and it should flip this. We always look at it from the back. And you say, yeah, you know, that's a, that's a curvature, and we can get braced, and we talk to our physical therapist, we talk to our guidance counselor at school, because they're probably gonna need some extra time in between classes. We're gonna talk to our prosthetics and orthotics, and we're gonna talk to our uh, parents and say, all right, here's what our plan is. We're gonna, want her to be a kid, we want her to be in field hockey or soccer, but we're gonna want her to wear the brace at night, because that way she robs Peter to pay Paul and she can have six hours out of the brace. Um, so it's a bit of a counseling session too, and that's how we treat them. Um, these are my squirts again, so. But thank you so much for having me. Hopefully you guys have learned. It's a lot to absorb, and you know, it's, uh, you gotta imagine how many years we've done this collectively, and here we are still learning ourselves. So always feel free to ask questions, please. Thank you very much.